Well, hello, my name is David Zavadil. I'm the pastor of Eastminster Presbyterian Church, and you are now watching Reformed Theology from a Recliner. Now, your first question may be, why do you call this Reformed Theology from a Recliner? Well, simple answer is because that's where I'm sitting at the moment, in my recliner downstairs. Uh, I intended to keep these videos succinct and laid back and as unstuffy as possible, and I felt I needed to get out of my little studio area I had created so that uh, we can just keep this uh, a little more informal, a little more laid back. And so that's where we are. Well, let's go ahead and dive into today, uh, today's discussion. Uh, up until the 1500s, there were basically only two churches. The Eastern Church, or the Orthodox Churches, from which we get the Greek Orthodox Church and the Russian Orthodox Churches and those, and the Western Church, or the Roman Catholic Church. On October 31st, 1517, Martin Luther, a German monk, posted his 95 Theses. This was uh, a, a document of 95 propositions to debate and discuss concerning issues within the church. Luther's hope was for a reformation of the church, to reform the things, the problems he saw within the church. Needless to say, these theses were not received well by the church leaders, uh, Luther would be put on trial and, and would be excommunicated, not once, but I believe three different times because of his views. But that day is considered the start of what we call the Reformation. History has tar termed this era where the Protestant church was founded and, and, and came from the, the Reformation period. Now, when we talk about Reformed theology, are the name Reformed Theology comes from this period. Now, some might equate Reformed Theology with Calvinism, and while that's partially true, that's not totally fair. Uh, they re think of this because it refer, many refer to the five points of Calvinism as the essence of the Reformed faith. But those five points are just part of the Reformed faith, and there are different expressions depending on the church background that you were in. The call for the Reformation at that time was not for a new religion, but for a new faith based on a biblical theology. I want to take just a moment and talk about this difference between religion and theology. For religion is as old as man, since it is essentially man-derived and man-made. A simple definition of religion is the beliefs and lifestyles men develop that enables them to worship and to serve, whether it's to serve themselves and worship themselves or to serve a God. Let me parse this just a little bit. Religion is first off a set of beliefs. It's a created system by men for the benefit of men. The beliefs may or may not include a God. It's also a lifestyle created by these same men. It gives them a set of goals to live by, a standard, a bar to set, and in a way to determine if you're being religious or not, if you're fulfilling the duties. Religion enables men to live and to serve, and boiled down, it's really just a series of check boxes. And if we check all of the right boxes, then we'll be all right. If we don't, then we're in trouble. Now, we're not talking about religion here. There is no Reformed religion. What we're talking about is theology. And the natural question there is, what is theology? When you look at the word theology, it breaks down from the Greek from the word theos, which is Greek for the word God, and logia, which is Greek for words. And, and so a translation, a literal translation of it would be words about God or the study of God. The primary difference between a religion and a theology is that a religion is a man-centered way to, to act toward God and maybe learn about God, but theology is a God-centered means to understand and to know what God desires and wants in our life. Theology is the study of God in every areas of our lives. How does God interact with man and vice versa? Theology essentially is, is scriptural thinking. For the scriptures guide our understanding of God and his working. In fact, the Westminster Shorter Catechism teaches us that it is scriptures that is our only rule and guide in all things of faith. That we're to look at the scriptures to, to understand God and to learn more about him. So when we use the term Reformed Theology, 
What we are meaning is the study of God from his word following the reformer's perspective. Now, you may be saying, wait a minute, so isn't that Calvinism? Isn't that what the five points of Calvinism teach? Well, that's a yes and a no. As we'll see in coming sessions, uh, it, it, it's not fully there. That's not quite right. The Reformed faith is far more than just the five points of Calvinism. The five points, in fact, came about in response to five positions that were put forth by a group of semi-Pelagians, a heresy that was condemned by the Council of Orange in 529. This, this group were called the Arminians after Jacob Arminius. The Remonstrants uh, was this, this group. The Remonstrants uh, were a group of Belgic theologians who put together this five-point manifesto based on the teachings of Jacob Arminius. J.I. Packer outlines their, their five points in this way. First, man is not so corrupt that he cannot savingly believe the gospel when it is put before him. Second, he is never so completely controlled by God that he cannot reject that same gospel. Thirdly, God's election is prompted by his foreknowledge of those who will believe on their own account. Fourth, Christ's death did not ensure the salvation of anyone, for it did not secure the gift of faith for anyone. In fact, they believe there is no such gift. What it did was rather to create the possibility of salvation for everyone if they believe. And fifth, it rests with the believers to keep themselves in a state of grace by keeping up their faith. Those who fail here fall away and are lost. Packer would go on to say Arminianism, or the Remonstrance, made man's salvation depend ultimately on man himself, thus religion, like we were talking about earlier, saving faith being viewed throughout as man's own work and because of his own, not God's, in him. In 1618, the Synod of Dort met to answer the Remonstrance, and what was produced was what is now known as the Five Points of Calvinism, or TULIP. Again, let's turn to J.I. Packer as he outlines these five states. First, uh, the first uh, point was that fallen man in his natural state lacks all power to believe the gospel, just as he lacks all power to believe the law, despite all external inducements that may be extended to him. Secondly, God's election is free, sovereign, unconditional choice of sinners as sinners to be redeemed by Christ, given faith, and brought to glory. Thirdly, that the redeeming work of Christ has its end and goal in the salvation of the elect. Fourth, the work of the Holy Spirit in bringing men to faith never fails to achieve its object. Fifthly, believers are kept in faith and grace by the unconquerable power of God till they come to glory. This can be summed up in the tulip acrostic that we've, we've all heard, summed up in the, in the words total depravity, unconditional election, limited atonement, irresistible grace, and the preservation of the saints. These two views created a dichotomy of religion and theology. On one hand, Arminianism is a man focus with man at the center of their study of the Scripture and the, Lo and the Lord, thus creating this man-based religious viewpoint, attempting to create a, a faith based upon it, but because man is the center, the faith can only be put into man, not into God. Reformed theology, however, is God-focused, with a focus on God, that God is, on how God is at work in and through the scriptures in the lives of his people. From 1619 until the late 1800s, the Reformed theology viewpoint was the prominent viewpoint in the Protestant church. But since the late 1800s, the Arminian view of God, man, the scriptures, and the church has risen to prominence. Where, till where we are today, it is common in almost every congregation, every church uh, in, in your neighborhood. The theology that we profess at Eastminster Presbyterian Church that we profess to hold on to is now the minority view in Christendom. But keep in mind that the minority view does not mean that it is wrong. 
just that it's not widely accepted. Over the course of the next few weeks, we're going to be looking at aspects of the Reformed faith and its application to our lives. That's the purpose of Reformed theology from the recliner. I hope that you'll join me next time as we delve into this. If you can, join us on Sundays. Uh, as we finish up Jonah this week, we'll beginning, be beginning a new series on the five solas of the Reformation, and we'll be looking at those in our next uh, video. May God bless you, and I hope that I'll see you soon. Take care.